Have you ever wondered what lies beyond the gates of the world's most iconic palace? I'm not talking about some fairy tale castle shrouded in early morning mist. I mean the real home where a real king wakes each day to attend to real matters of state. The palace houses Britain's beloved monarch right in the heart of London itself, Buckingham Palace. Can you imagine rising out of Egyptian cotton sheets in the same private apartments once inhabited by royal figures who shaped the destiny of an empire? What might it be like to glimpse priceless masterpieces lining the halls on your way to meetings in rooms where Winston Churchill himself often sat as a trusted advisor? Does a secret door concealed behind velvet curtains really lead to a hidden indoor pool installed for King Edward VII himself? And is there truly a 5000 piece collection of Faberge eggs gifted by Russian Tsars on display somewhere in the bowels of the palace's vaults? So let's discover what life looks like today inside Buckingham Palace. We'll trace legends etched into weathered stone from a time when dukes and earls held court here rather than kings and queens. Uncover why more than one monarch across the centuries sought refuge behind these walls during episodes of war, plague and palace intrigue threatening turbulent ends to their rule. A palace rises from unlikely grounds. As our black polished palace tour vehicle passes the soaring bronze Victoria Memorial Fountain, it's hard to imagine the humble landscape predating this regal estate. But long before a winged statue representing victory crowned these grounds, they were merely a pleasant countryside respite for titled gentlemen seeking fresh air beyond London's congested 17th century confines. In grand Jacobean style, the first lavish residence christened Arlington House rose on this site in 1624 as a stately mansion for an ambitious Sir Edmund Wright, craving proximity to Westminster's bustling political scene. Gardens sculpted in tidy parterres, flanked by embroidered brick facades topped with pristine white sash windows in the fashion of noble estates. Yet Sir Edmund lived barely two years to enjoy vistas opened by ten arched windows overlooking what would become Green Park. As fate would have it, his impressive manner passed on to aristocrat Henry Jermyn, the first Earl of St Albans, and an intimate confidant in exile of Queen Henrietta Maria, wife of the beheaded Charles the Russ. With the restoration of her son Charles II to the throne in 1660, Henry found himself suddenly very well positioned and conveniently already housing in style. Over subsequent decades, fine ladies and gentlemen came to call at his salons filling parlours with music, mirth and flirtatious banter until the wee hours. But all merriment faded after Henry's death in 1683, when a relatively unknown baron named John Sheffield acquired the fashionable property's lease. As if an omen, five months later smallpox ravaged London, swiftly killing thousands and sending polite society fleeing the overcrowded capital. During the epidemic's violent 18-month siege, only behind Arlington House's fortified brick walls did John's household remain largely unscathed, saving the fortunate baron who just happened to reside part-time outside the city and several senior staff sequestered on site. While all around, terror and decay overwhelmed nearly every fine Mayfair home as the black-cloaked spectre relished England's grim offering. When at last a quiet pool settled over empty streets littered with death's remnants, John emerged to find fortune radically reversed. King Charles II himself was newly impressed by the young baron's competence managing the crisis, and swiftly conferred higher rank as the first Duke of Buckingham and Normanby, awarding a choice apartment in royal residence Windsor Castle and prized official post, overseeing pivotal land holdings across Ireland. Yet the ambitious Duke wisely chose Arlington House as principal home when conducting affairs of state back in London. Embarking on extensive property updates, installing the latest Dutch fineries like Delft tiled hearths and carved corbels supporting marble busts. Soon firmly re-establishing the estate as the epicenter of not just political discourse, but civilized high society. Every glamorous poet, scholar, musician or painter enriched John's conversational salons over sumptuous dining on silver trencher plates. Names history came to be revered like philosopher John Locke, rattling enlightenment ideals in the very drawing room where future kings would one day hold court. Could you ever conceive such in those early genteel rooms glowing amber and sage in candlelight that the fate of empire itself would later be decided where once laughter echoed over philosophical debates? 
In ways neither man nor monarch could then predict, the manor destined to become famous as palace would survive nearly eight decades virtually unaltered before royal attention revived. After the Duke's passing, Arlington House changed hands, eventually sold in 1735 to Lord Granville and family who undertook minor updates. Timing again propitious, as King George II sought another comfortable London residence for his wife Queen Caroline nearer Westminster's political nexus, so enamoured of the estate's modest charms, within a year the King negotiated permanent purchase of house and grounds from Lord Granville for his son Prince Frederick and Bride Augusta, further embarking on modern enhancements like running water, heating stove and more bedchambers suitable to royal pedigree, throwing glittering facts boasting musical performances by Handel himself, premiering early compositions in their subtle grandeur. Little did devoted guests, cheering the encore of water music that evening, realize the legacy prematurely fading Frederick's early death would set in motion. Upon Frederick's passing months later, grief-stricken father King George II not only further expanded staterooms to support heir George III's household, but granted continued grace and favor residence to widowed Augusta as homage to her esteemed firstborn, allowing Frederick's brother George III secure establishment to woo and wed the charming Sophia Charlotte of Mecklenburg-Strelitz in 1761, whose mutual affection grew fast once settled into happy domesticity at restyled Buckingham House, their growing brood soon tottering through leafy grounds. And here is where our tour takes a more familiar turn, onto the path of kings and queens more recognizable from history lessons and novels. For the next resident crowned after lifelong farmer George III's eventful rule was none other than England's iconic diamond for over six decades, good Queen Victoria herself, whose birth, marriage and early years unfolded within Buckingham House until one fateful June morning. Coronation officials called her forth to Westminster, and she returned to the palace's cocooned arms no longer princess, but anointed sovereign. Imagine the anticipation Queen Victoria herself must have felt at age 18, crossing back over this threshold no longer as carefree princess, but now anointed sovereign, met not by familiar faces who had nurtured her lonely childhood, but by bowing lords waiting to fulfill her command as their newly crowned Britain's solitary supreme leader. Weary from public spectacle and the crown's leaden weight, the new queen's first glimpses at private chambers so cherished in girlhood likely kindled mixed emotions. These comforting rooms evoking bittersweet memories of palace intrigues suffered, and innocent pleasures lost contrasted with the thrill of influence's heady intoxication. Visions for glittering court life danced through her royal imagination, as Victoria, the woman, the wife and someday mother processed expectations facing Victoria the untried monarch. But the reality of conducting daily affairs of state from within the charming if limited Queen's house soon strained patience and practicality, as her new husband Prince Albert and advisers urged more expansive accommodations befitting the British Empire's reach, and the pragmatic Prussian prince well understood the symbol's power for boosting national unity and pride. What Victorians needed was a visible celebration of British ingenuity, wealth and dominance. An impenetrable palace fortress in the heart of London, declaring England's ascendancy on the world stage. Prince Albert himself oversaw design proposals to expand their private home into a resplendent yet comfortable base for entertaining diplomats, heads of state and royalty from across Europe's princely courts. Ever cognizant of Australia's famine, Canada's strife and Africa's ongoing slave trade, pleading action beneath the crown, setting painful personal priorities which demanded attention before laying foundation stones for lavish halls that could wait. Until 1847, when at last Albert commenced lengthy renovations lasting 16 years, transforming Buckingham House into today's iconic 775-room palace, masterfully integrating the old manor's signature conservatory wing into a spectacular new classical east facade, crowned by balustraded parapets wrapping the famous balcony overlooking the Victoria Memorial and Mall beneath which glittering processions ushered young Princess Elizabeth out one May morning in 1939, on her way to claim history's mantle worn for over seven decades since. But what truly lies beyond those iconic gold-leaf gates fronting ambassadorial courts and the grand entrance? 
What first arrests the eye rising three stories overhead is the grand staircase cantilevered double helix floating weightless in space. Branching staircases built from pale silken Portland stone cured three full years before sculpting to prevent cracks. Rouge marble from France's Pyrenees and pristine Carrara from Tuscany's Apuan Alps adorn intricate vine-inlaid stone balusters contrasting the crisp whiteness. Steps precisely six inches taller than normal to allow graceful ascension by court ladies once billowing in satins and silks at state events without stumbling. Though few pause to lean gazing upward through John Nash's magnificent iron-framed skylight, casting bright dancing colors from F.C. Eden's rich stained glass coats of arms dating to 1849. What unseen dramas or dashed hopes might that luminous glass or aged stairs reveal if stones could speak? We climb past gilded cornices toward the opulent staterooms where influencing world events begins over brandy and cigars. But to reach the epicenter of power, one must first navigate reception halls of splendor nearly overwhelming human senses. Cross the lofty throne room's crimson silk damask walls beneath Waterford crystal chandeliers until reaching antechambers guarding the innermost circle, privy council rooms for approved guests only. Here, behind closed doors, Prime Ministers Winston Churchill and Margaret Thatcher pled military resources and economic sanctions, bringing rebellious enemies to heel. While fractious Soviet Russia's Premier Gorbachev argued glasnost policy expanding freedom and President Bush Sr. privately discussed mutual trading terms both influenced by surrounding wealth and history's heavy aura. Priceless oil canvases by Da Vinci, Rembrandt and Gainsborough gaze down imparting silent wisdom to aid monarchs reigning amidst vexing modern complexities. Guide us, great masters of sacrifices and leadership demands. Just ahead, corded golden tassels draw back double doors unveiling the royal blue drawing room still hosting arriving diplomats like South Africa's freshly released Nelson Mandela. Beneath resplendent Baccarat crystal chandeliers, remain seated weaving inspiration before addressing the United Nations that same week. Were these gilded walls privy to the private torment of doubts or nightmarish past haunting even heroic heads come to beg the crown's goodwill? What memories echoed in Queen Elizabeth's own mind meeting Mandela's still gaze while clasping his outstretched palm with dignity neither prejudice nor hardship could break? But from consummate statecraft, we emerge rejoining everyday tourists gaping at the ballroom's soaring cathedral splendor. Vaulted ceilings hand-gilded in filigree leaf stretch upwards over 20 feet high, permitting no less than nine crystal chandeliers, sparkling mirrored reflections. Ranks of tall arched windows frame panoramic vistas over private gardens which once flanked tennis courts, where Prince William and Duke Harry laughed chasing stray shots. Here upon gleaming parquet oak floors inset with patriotic emblems, young Prince Charles learned proper waltz posture to maneuver debutantes without crushing voluminous taffeta gowns, or perhaps stole first awkward adolescent kiss behind marble columns with some duke's daughter at his birthday gala, before inevitably gaining notoriety in tabloids as crown prince better suited to polo than palace balls. Yet on this polished floor lay far more than fathoms of wood patiently lacquered 30 coats strong, Inset across its expanse, bordered by fleur-de-lis and Tudor knots, bloom tender rose, hardy thistle, noble leek and shamrock in exquisite marquetry, symbolizing the United Kingdom's unified heritage. Timeless craft frame by frame, patiently composed entirely freehand using chisels and mallets, we would surely blister clumsy 21st century fingers trying to recreate, yet look closer still at the seemingly historic floor only to discover its magnificence, dating a mere hundred years before present day. Why? Because that earlier parquet wood mapping far longer anchored the British generation upon generation underwent sudden destruction. Ironically, neither by palace coup nor by strife or flame, but in service to install modern technology, cinema film reels for a royal picture show. Oh, what forebears sacrificed heedless of cost to indulge their newsreel addiction patches of heritage for reels of novelty, leaving only this replica tribute to step where kings and queens of centuries past once trod upon the genuine treasure we trample scarcely noticing beneath our feet. Humbling thought what posterity's feet may someday tread valuing modern must-haves we now demand. Beyond merely baseboards and parquet, what other tales might cling unvoiced to silk damask walls embracing this chamber since 1856? 
patiently enduring spectacle and scandal playing out upon this polished stage like a reality production through the ages. One envisions ambitious mothers pinching nervous daughters' arms, whispering they must secure a titled husband before seasons change. Can you hear the gay laughter of gaslit pre-war debutante balls swirling until dawn before guns of warfare thunder across the pastoral landscape? Strain to hear echoes of Churchill conferring in low tones the state of Hitler's stalled Eastern campaign, or numbers of merchant marine ships lost that harrowing week. Did phantom notes from Vera Lynn's defiant anthem, We'll Meet Again, ever wander this glittering gallery, bringing bittersweet tears to the eyes of some homesick soldier, sailor or lonely widow years later? Oh, if only ethereal sound waves imprint themselves on time and walls alone could speak, what revelations might yet pour forth? Secrets overheard from inebriated lips, sly trysts in window alcoves, proud noses turned up dismissing the hour's dreadful fashion, or whispers that compare queenly blunders. Perhaps grunts behind Chinese Coromandel screens concealing obese Victoria's effort, rising to greet officials with royal dignity intact before collapsing in private agony from hemorrhoids and gout, or the unguarded giggle escaping demure Princess Margaret's lips watching portly chefs wobble atop ladders hanging Christmas garlands just over the balcony, until suddenly crashing down in comedic spectacle, we shall never know more than hints of humanity behind the gilded facade. Yet perhaps such mystery lends enduring magic that titillates curiosity, aching to know hidden truths. For behind the romance and allure of crowns, coaches and bowing subjects exists lives as messy as our own. Mortals embodying hopes both banal and desperate as an empire's shifting fortunes and scandals play out on public stage with little mercy. Yet on they reign, remaking mistake and myth alike generation upon generation as resolutely as North Star abides, a private peak behind palace gates. But now, the stateroom's splendor fades behind us while entering the palace's innermost sanctum, private apartments never exposed to public tours. Up a discreet winding stairwell still displaying 18th century Flemish tapestries, we reach the first barrier past liveried guards into cloistered third floor tranquility. The instantly recognizable cipher spells out a cryptic emblem crowned with regalia, denoting the sovereign ruler's personal domain unseen by multitudes who stand beyond in awe. Weighty polished doors draw silently inward revealing treasures few outsiders witness, except perhaps the American president or visiting prime minister. Here unfolds the more intimate life of the royal family at home and at ease. Walking halls lined not by masters like Rubens, but family photos, children's crayon portraits, and even occasional finger-painting mishaps escaping the nanny's purge. Instead of open public galleries, quiet sitting rooms welcome guests longing for confidential counsel. The decor tends more shabby chic than imperial gilt. Variegated tufted sofas accessorized by dog-eared magazines and table lamps emitting a homey glow. Just ahead in the oak doorway, glimpse rarefied Sanctum Sanctorum itself. The King's audience chamber is still dominated by imposing framed portraits of 19th century grandees overseeing affairs. Wing chairs worn smooth by worried regents and diplomats anxiously debating dispatch orders that determined critical war campaigns. Queen Victoria herself likely paced the floral Savonnery carpets as beloved Prince Albert wasted dying by bronchial infection in the nearby Blue Room never seen by the public. Now the current monarch, King Charles III, passes solitary hours within these same four walls, absorbing timeless echoes to steady personal resolve shepherding his nation through uncertain straits ahead. Perhaps weary feet even accidentally brush a loose floorboard triggering some hidden latch paneling the study walls to briefly reveal secret passageways for covert travel or clandestine trysts once known to amorous nobles. Though present dignitaries might simply discover the king's favorite corgi napping on a tartan blanket behind the desk. Just next door, Her Majesty Queen Camilla dictates keen social correspondence to her ladies-in-waiting, circulating through aristocratic circles both tending damaged ties from past scandals and mending contemporary rifts, before mingling with ladies who lunch over cucumber tea sandwiches, chicken salad and lemon tarts, all served on hand-painted mint and china with such casual elegance.
Down the hall, reservation cards on side tables reserve private apartments for visiting family members like Princess Anne or Prince Andrew and Fergie, if reconciliation ever allows. While Prince William and Duchess Kate maintain their own self-contained suite, personalized with a restful blue and white nautical theme near the old nursery rooms. Surrounded by archival English oak furnishings handed down for generations and family photos chronicling their brood's early years before removing to Windsor's even more private confines. Just below, few realize the palace conceals its own secret indoor swimming pool installed for hedonistic King Edward VII at the turn of last century. Though later monarchs like Elizabeth II herself put the glass-enclosed chamber to more practical discipline, swimming laps within its lustrous sea-green marble walls. Historians claim the glass skylight's playful painted cherubs frolicking across clouds overhead were modeled on youthful images of Edward's longtime mistress, the alluring actress Lily Langtree provocatively posing as a nymph, perhaps explaining Poole's gently arced sensual lines still conveying an ambience of discreet Edwardian glamour. From precious antiques to priceless art, beyond the inner sanctum of private royal apartments, we descend to lower levels rarely included on even insider palace tours. Here in vast vaulted basements beneath the upper state room's parquet floors reside treasures amassed across centuries of British conquest spanning the globe. Room after room brims with rare collectibles like the 5000 Faberge egg collection gifted by Russian Tsars. Magnificent gem encrusted samovars from Persia, elephant thrones from India phased in ivory and gold, jewel studded tiaras from China's imperial family, and more spill across shelves. Priceless oil canvases not currently on display crowd storage racks, including alternative works by Rembrandt, Gainsborough, and rare Da Vinci sketches on tea stained parchment. You gasp, spotting a smaller work table bearing Vermeer's rare Girl with the Pearl curiously missing signature due to over-aggressive cleaning centuries past. Nearby in the cedar cabinet, neglected Van Eyck silver point drawings dating before his more famous Arnolfini wedding silently disintegrate begging rescue to public view. Myriad rooms thread deeper still into palace bowels revealed to few without highest security clearances. Entire chambers devoted to cataloging archives from across centuries of diplomatic dealings, private journals, official state papers, and handwritten letters exchanged between monarchs and heads of state. Carefully climate-controlled environment balances temperature and humidity, documenting critical chapters affecting policies and power brokering today. Just peering into the royal philatelic collection room itself turns grown men giddy, Floor-to-ceiling banks of cabinet drawers slide open revealing the British Empire's entire 19th and 20th century stamps collection started by young Prince Bertie, the man who loved organizing as a calming hobby before reluctantly ascending the crown as King George VI. What travel adventures or quests for exotic acquisitions epic stories surely lay tucked inside those tiny paper squares, if only they could share their past. The heart behind the gilded gates. Yet for all the obvious treasures on display for those granted access, deeper inside palace gates, the greatest value resides not in vaults or on walls, but in the day-by-day -day stewardship shaping peace and goodwill behind those walls. Moments rarely recognized or celebrated in grandeur, but instead found in the steadfast devotion of servants caring for needs or advisors, counseling difficult decisions far from the throne rooms or assembly halls. We glimpse such selfless glory revealed in careworn faces hovering nearby, should a teacup need warming, though the hour grows late. In the discretion of clerical staff fully aware certain sealed documents or intercepted briefs contain revelations that could inflame scandal-obsessed media, but who takes delicate secrets gently to the grave, or in palace chaplain dutifully roused from bed to offer private communion sacrament, if sovereign butler whispers to the royal household deemed the need urgent. What comes clearer wandering unnoticed halls few visitors tread is the enormity of isolating bubble fame's glare casts around inhabitants here both in gratitude and sadness. Enviable unfettered access yet little relaxed spontaneity left unveiled beyond the inner circle's tight circumference. Until the wise ruler comprehends shadow cannot stand without light and one shines brighter only by reflecting the other. Thus, the noble monarch opens wary arms to the stranger called friend or rival to prove virtue stronger than vain pride or position. 
and in rare moments of authentic unity, tentative hopes emerge for trust builds gradually what no authority can compel even a queen to decree by sovereign reputation alone.